Is this on? Oh, I guess so. <laughs> okay, thank you all very much. Those very interesting and thought-provoking presentations. Do we have any questions from the committee? Kathleen? So, um, we've heard from you that the WIC program can be an agent of food socialization. I hadn't turned, heard that term before, but it's definitely something, the concept has come up in our discussions. And that seems to be, um, in some ways, in conflict with social accept with the cultural acceptability. So you might say, from a dietary guidelines point of view, the whole grains are acting as a form of socialization to um, to people to get to eat more whole grains to help students in school become uh, to help young children become students in school who eat these various foods. And yet those seem to be foods that are decidedly unpreferred. Would any of you like to give the committee some advice about how we should navigate the shoals of uh, uh, cultural acceptability and food socialization? Well, it definitely is a top-down approach um, because we have the dietary guidelines, we have the recommendations, the school, um, school meals, and um, some, some things are mandated. And um, it's very tricky because we have the science and then we have the reality. Um, I think that change can take time. Unfortunately, the contact hours with the WIC providers, um, the nutrition educators, um, there's not that much time. So um, I would advocate probably for more social media engagement, um, especially with um, younger women millennial mothers. Um, I'm currently working on a project um, of just breastfeeding with one of my doctoral students and we're focusing on trying to create a culture of change for breastfeeding with young black mothers and we're using mm -hmm. that through Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, they like to take pictures of themselves including their tattooed breast. Mm -hmm. So we're just kind of going where that information is. <laughs> so, um, so I think that um, what Joe is talking about with the community health workers, mm -hmm. but I just think that social media has to be a part of that, um, that we need to be reaching out, and if the education cannot, the education cannot just be a one-time thing, once a year or once every you know, six months. And I think also if we can affirm that the foods that they do have in their culture is good, mm -hmm. and that you can add without trying to diminish, if that makes sense, um, that it is supplementary nature, um, and that if th the same thing about encouraging new foods, but we have to affirm people's culture, um, and that they've survived thus far with it. Um, I think also the transition to Americanized foods and everything else that goes along with that, um, I would just say the opportunities that, that exist for social media engagement, especially when we have limited time now for nutrition education, whether or not it's through a larger caseload, and I just think that avenue is very, very ripe, especially for young mothers. I think I would, I would build on that if I could. Uh, I think, you know, the social media is, 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 is definitely good, but I think the other thing is setting up groups and virtually setting up support groups. Mm -hmm. And perhaps it's doing education in a, in a group setting because we found when we had mother's activities, which was not a focus of what we were doing, it was to keep mothers busy while their children were involved in group discussions, that the nature of the group was sharing ideas and sharing experiences so they could build on the education. And right. I think if we think about that yeah. along, along with the social media. Because in social media they like, they comment on each other mm -hmm. and they're posting. So for example, we're doing the hashtag black women do breastfeed mm -hmm. and you'll be surprised. And so we're analyzing not just the visual data of their breast, mm -hmm. but also the comments that are made and they are encouraging each other, supporting each other. And we're just watching the conversation. We're not even driving it. We don't see, um, we don't see um, organizations or any of the, the federal agents. They're not part, they don't have a social media presence. Mm -hmm. So one of the challenges for, I mean, I'm, I'm hearing wonderful ideas here, and I hope some of the people who uh, work for WIC are able to take away these concepts. 
Our charge is the food package. Mm -hmm. um, so if we come back to the food package, one of the places the committee has to act is to offer alternatives that would be more culturally acceptable mm -hmm. to some of the primary mm -hmm. items. Mm -hmm. They also have to meet something that sounds like um, some similar characteristic. So you've mentioned um, um, not whole wheat pasta, n not the yellow cheese, the white cheese, the amount of fat and the milk, Where's the beef? <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But um, if, we, if we were a, bit, a little more positive about it, what, where do you think alternatives are necessary? Um, halal foods, for example, well, which halal foods um, could you suggest to the committee that we should consider? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a big question. Well, hal halal has more to do with how the food is prepared, prepared right? Prepared, it's a rather issue. than oh, and, it's veg a, and vegetarian. Yeah, 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 right. right. And for most, and for most people, kosher foods are acceptable mm -hmm. um, for people who eat halal. Mm -hmm. So I think it's again reading food labels, mm -hmm. because a lot of the foods, a lot of kosher foods, are there already in the store, even if they don't have halal mm -hmm. certification. Right. Right. So again, it mm -hmm. comes down to the education mm -hmm. of look for the K at the bottom or look for these symbols. Uh -huh. They're perfectly they're right. perfectly fine with regards to your religion. It's that education piece. I don't think because there's a lack of the halal mm -hmm. food that's out there mm -hmm. so much as some in some places. Aware. It depends on where yeah. you are. And I think that your comment about uh, translation is not interpreting. We we do get kind of proud of ourselves about all the translations we have, but uh, we we were very humbled in the last year working more closely with our Somali population because many of the women uh, who come from Somalia don't read Somali, much less English. So they've got this book in Somali, which they can't read, and a check that's in English that they can't read either. And so we are actually working on a more visual food package. But I think the ability to add some things that are more, even if it were in a lesser quantity in some kind of, to, to balance some of the brown rice with the white rice or something mm -hmm. like that, so that uh, we could honor you know their tradition uh, and encourage them to try some other things that might be might be more uh, less expensive easier to find maybe more uh, nutrition uh, based uh, but that that transition is especially for, I'm thinking primarily of immigrants so that's a that's a really hard transition to make mm -hmm. and I would just add that when we developed our I didn't show a photo of them our healthy plates as we call them the idea was to show on the, on the plate side, these are your foods, because mm -hmm. we were having a really difficult time anchoring our patients in mm -hmm. better diets because they didn't eat steak and potatoes. <laughs> and the second page was where we combined cultural foods with things like whole grain cereal. And so it was, a comp comp it was complementing both, mm -hmm. here are common breakfast foods, um, but here are some whole grain options. And so that led to more dialogue through the visuals that we chose on that second page of our Healthy Plate handout, um, which we did do focus groups with, and we learned a lot, and we were humbled by our West African population. And we're like, oh, we put fufu on the plate, but it shouldn't be in a plate, it should be in a bowl. And so, <laughs> anyway. I can give you a I was struck by your comment about breakfast cereals and how that's not a part of many um, cultural traditions. And I wondered as you, uh, if you can give us any guidance if there are culturally acceptable alternatives to breakfast cereals, um, recognizing that they might not necessarily be grain-based, but where they are grain-based, what might be whole grain or what might be some things we think about for the breakfast cereals. I, I am not the expert. I want to go back to I'm a social worker, but I have uh, I do have some uh, references that are really useful in terms of looking at breakfast in, in different cultures, and I can certainly provide that to you. Um, like I said, fish, soup, rice uh, are, are common in, in um, lots of cultures, um, and this cereal thing is just kind of weird to, to most folks. So. I'm not the expert, but I know I can get you a resource, and many, probably many of you already have that. But um. The Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics right. has a really good book. I can't remember the name. It's a cultural book, um, A through Z, mm -hmm. on different foods and, and options. But for example, you know, the populations that I deal with, uh, 
Uh, boiled root vegetables mm. are an acceptable alternative for breakfast. If it's a cereal, it's often a hot cereal. I have many patients that actually take cornflakes and warm it up mm -hmm. um, to make it more like a hot cereal or things like cornmeal, um, cream of wheat, uh, oats, but made more like a beverage than you know, a thick, mm. clumpy oatmeal, yeah. um, often with evaporated milk and sugar, but that's an, a teaching opportunity. Mm -hmm. I would probably say, actually, um, I would disagree a little bit. Um, actually, dry breakfast cereal is very popular in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. It's actually considered, when you have enough money, you can then go buy dry cereal, oh. like cornflakes. So it's an economic thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that wherever you go in the world, you'll see cornflakes. It's the fact that it's the whole grain <laughs> cereal, that's the issue. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people are porridge-based um, mm -hmm. cultures. So you'll have, so again, the oatmeal um, and the cream of wheat, um, the cornmeal, but if you're not providing corn. Um, but, um, so, so I think that even the ones that, ah, oh, we can now buy cornflakes, now that we're in America, which is considered moving up, the mm -hmm. food chain, mm -hmm. but then when you look at the WIC foods that are available, mm -hmm. um, because they'll put a lot of sugar on top of that cornflakes mm -hmm. also. <laughs> and I know that my parents, they will put hot milk on top of the cornflakes because they want a hot, hot cereal. cereal. Mm -hmm. And that's considered in terms of breakfast. So um, I wouldn't say it's the, the dry cereals per se. It's all of that whole grain. Mm -hmm. That's the, <laughs> it's, all, it's all of the, the whole grain chewy things, um, but again, I think if it's, you don't have to have it every day. Yeah. It, it, if, if it is you do it once or twice a week, I think that we think of you eating breakfast every day, you're eating cereal every day. So I think sometimes it's how the message is, mm -hmm. um, is interpreted. And then also, again, I think that Christina made a great point, even with the oatmeal, that it doesn't have to be this thing where I see the way you put toppings. We don't put toppings on our oatmeal. <laughs> I see, I'm, and I'm like, <laughs> we could, so, so just in terms of, and I'm from the, I mean, I'm as American as you can get it with an accent, but, <laughs> but here's the oatmeal, but this is how you can prepare it to make your atole or some of the other, other things. I think mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's how you bring it down. Yeah. But it's the whole grains. <laughs> Great. Any other questions? Okay. Well, with that and all this talk about all this good food, <laughs> we're going to take lunch. Thank you. And I, there's a handout at the registration desk for places for folks. Thank you. We'll be back at 1.30. Uh,